I want you to visualize first this thing, kind of put it up here a little bit, and I'm making my hands in the frame of the language of the shape that it is, and it's kind of parentheses, right? Parentheses. And by definition, parentheses are a purposeful or necessary injection. Got it? Visualizing? Now what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to imagine this. I'd like you to imagine before that an L and then an I, and then I want the left, left parenthesis, and then I want a space, and then I want the right parenthesis, and I want FE. It's life with an injection or a purposeful injection. And what I've been figuring out over the last 25 years, but more specifically the last three, is how important this idea is around the idea of purposeful injections and necessary injections and insertions of life in your life. And I'd like you to ask this question of yourself. If you were to put more life in your life, what would you put in it? If you were to put more life in your life, what would you put in it? And so for 25 years, I've had this really crazy, fun, globe-trotting career where I got to consult with the biggest companies in the world and go into offices with Jeff Immelt at GE and, 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 and it goes on and on and on. And some of the most amazing people I've met are in the corporate world because they are important people doing important work to change the world. And that's the focus I, I take. But as I started to work with them, I got to talk about the topics of creativity and innovation and inspiration and growth and strategy. And all those words were the words I chewed on and debated and catalyzed and, and consulted on and, and spoke to and helped define with these big companies around the world. And then it all changed. It all changed on one night about three years ago in Palo Alto with a group of people at a steak place in a strip mall that wasn't very sexy, but there we were. My book had launched, and it was the global tour of book launch stuff, and one of the tactics was dinner parties at steak joints and strip malls. I don't know where they got strip malls from, but there we were. And I was with all the executives and a whole hope of about 20 of them from places like Facebook and Google and Yahoo and Juniper Networks and all the Silicon ba Valley executives and brass. And we were talking about growth and change and innovation and change and, and strategy and inspiration. And as we're talking, I felt a bit of a lull in the room. And it didn't quite register like it should. This topic has been worked and talked and consulted on and embedded in companies for a long time. But I saw a little bit of a deer in the headlight look. And it wasn't as fervent and passionate and, and, and kind of connected as it used to be. And then with one gentleman, after I glanced at him to the left about three different times and saw this very, very dear in the headlight look, I said with a bit of passion, directed kind to him, but kind to the whole room, I said, if you were to put more life in your life, what would you put in it? And these are the executives who travel the world and can make a lot of money and have great stock options and have a great life, supposedly. And on went a three-hour conversation about how they wanted to put travel and relatives and faith and family and gardening and bicycling and hiking and all the interestingness that they didn't have time for in this crazy world of a crazy calendar and a crazy to-do list and a crazy technological looking down and being alone together and all the stuff that was supposed to make your world more rich was actually taking from it from them. And when I said, how would you put more life in your life? The conversation went on for three hours in the most beautiful, harmonic, life, authentic, passionate way. And so it started this crazy, crazy journey I've been on for three years, figuring out and thinking about the things that could put more life in the life of people, but in my case, specifically executives at companies. And I've got about 150 things and principles that make up this idea of putting more life in your life. I want to walk you through three. It is New York five years ago. And there we are, and we are with my wife. And I'm going to use the lenses of family, because I think family is kind of an appropriate lens to look through for the idea of life. And so I'm with my daughter, Grace and Lottie, who are identical 10-year-olds at that point. I'm with my wife, Jill. I'm with her best friend, Janesse. And I'm with their daughter, Tally, who is my daughter's best friends. So you've got two, three little 10-year-olds, two adult women, and me. I'm the guy escorting these guys around Manhattan. It's Janessa's birthday. We had the perfect evening plan. Go down to lower Manhattan. Go to this one place called Supper. Eat the gnocchi. Have the seat outside. Have the birthday. Have the, have the um, tray leche cake come out. Sing happy birthday. And it was all scheduled. And all of a sudden, it just didn't feel right. It felt a little bit too perfect. It felt a little bit too <laughs> ceremonial, a little bit too planned. And so at the last minute, Jill said, let's go in here as we're on our way to Supper on the Lower East Side. And we duck in this other little Italian 
Italian joint, and we have this crowd, crazy, loud, ruckus dinner with an uncomfortable seating against the wall, and it wasn't the gnocchi, it was kind of a marginally good pizza, and we sang happy birthday, but nobody could listen to us, and nobody joined in, and it was kind of this messy thing, and we leave, but it was so messy, it was imperfectly perfect. And so we go outside, and I see, because we didn't spend all our money on the expensive meal at supper, I had a little extra cash, and I saw this limo guy standing right outside, and I said, Mr. Limo Guy, if I give you what is extra in my hand right now, would you, and all the women over here, would you just take us around the block and just kind of let us celebrate this birthday, a little surprise? And he kind of gave me the gentlemanly like, yeah, nod, and we're all, I open the door, and all of a sudden, all the girls are floating in, and my girls are like, oh my God, really, a black limousine, a stretch limousine in Manhattan, and there's summer night with the sunroof open, and we go on to drive around the block four or five times, and we are singing and dancing to Cool in the Gang, and my daughters have their heads out the sunroofs, and it was just like they were in college, but I didn't want them to be, and my daughter, my everyone's just, it's perfect, and we're, I'm kind of like virtually drinking a champagne in the back, and I'm kissing on my wife and hugging Janessa, and it's all great, and Lottie says from the front, because they wanted to push the little up and down slide, and Lottie goes, thanks, Dad, and I go, it's what we do. We take care of each other, and so we circle, and we stop. And the emotion runs through me as I tell this story because I visualize this moment. When I looked through, they all get out and they are bubbly. And it's a Manhattan Saturday night. And how do we deserve to be in a limousine driving around Lower Manhattan with Cool and the Gang and virtual champagnes just because we, we did, right? And as I look through to just thank the limousine driver, I saw him hunched over the steering wheel sobbing, sobbing. And so I walked around to the edge of the car and I opened the car door. And I said, get out. And we hugged. And we gave each other a really good hug. Not the kind of hug you hug when you're a gymnast and you kind of give the pat, pat, pat. <laughs> a real man hug. Like we held each other awkwardly long in the middle of the street and cars <laughs> had to veer around us. And we hugged. And I said, what just happened? He said, you just made me realize that I need to leave right now and go home to my family and give them a little bit of what you just gave them which was kind of a little bit of just a spontaneous moment of imperfection that just kind of happened to you, and I'm going to go do that right now. And my first lens for you to look through and the idea of putting more life in your life is this idea of imperfection over perfect, because Snoky dinner at supper and expensive and perfect trilogic cake wouldn't have yielded and netted out that great experience we had by playing it by ear and just letting it happen. Lens number one, imperfection always trumps and eats perfect for lunch. Perfect is overrated. Number two is we are at the Yankee Stadium. No, let me go to Barnes & Noble. How much time do I have? For an hour? That's awesome. So we are, so there we are. I'm going to go to Yankee Stadium. And we are at Yankee Stadium, and it's, we're in New York again. And we're at Yankee Stadium, and it is August 31st, and we are about to leave. We go to New York every year for the month of August as a radical sabbatical. And there we are, and it's the last day before we're going to leave, and it's two years ago when Hurricane Irene was pending on the East Coast. My wife says, we're leaving tomorrow. I said, okay, but before we leave, I want to take Grace and Lottie to a Yankee game. Jill goes online, gets some cheap seats. I cab out to the Yankee game. We get there. It's a terrible misty day as a result of the hurricane. And there we are sitting in these really bummer, bummer seats well under a canopy, way off the field. But it's probably better because we're covered because we have such crummy seats. And all the people out here are having to put umbrellas up and park us down. And the tarp comes on and the tarp comes off. And they're playing the Oakland A's. And for those of you who don't know baseball, four hours for four innings is a really long time. It's a really long time, and it's all the rain, and the tarp coming on, a tarp coming off, and tarp coming on, a tarp coming off. And I asked my friend, why so many foul balls? And he said, round on round, like in wet. It's not going to be perfect. It's going to go foul ball. Four hours, four, four innings. The Yankees are down 7-2. to two. They're down 7-2 to two to the Oakland A's. We had done everything. We had done all the DTMs, don't tell moms. We had... Me buy a beer, them get to put a finger in it and taste it. We had, the whole, we had the whole pull your finger and you know that game. And we did all that fun stuff that a dad does with the, his little girls at the Yankees game, sitting way back in the crummy seats and watching. And at about four hours in, Lottie says to me, Daddy, if we leave now, we can get in a cab and make it back to Soho and we can go get that Manny Petty from that Ukrainian manicurist and for like $100 for all four of us. So it was $25 head. That's really cheap and it'd be really great. And then we can go to Bond Street Sushi and have some sushi where the guys go like this when we walk in and you love that and we can do that before we leave tomorrow. It'd be a great close to our month in New York, wouldn't it? And I go, you know, that's good. And we get in the cab. No, we walk out and we're walking out and I've got my little girls and Jill's small and I'm small and they're small and I've got them on my fingers and we're walking out. And as I walk out, down seven to two, the Yankees, my team, 
I look up and I see the sun coming through these clouds and I see the mist off the, off, the, off the turf starting to come up and the tarp is coming off and the umbrellas are coming down and the parkers are coming off and then I see a Yankee from behind the dugout come up and look at the stands and go, yeah, and go down. And we walked out. And then five, eight hours later, it's about midnight, and we're back at the apartment. And Jill says, we're leaving at 7 a.m. You've got to go up to 4th Avenue, get our car, bring it back down here, load the entire month's worth of stuff, open down the five-story walk up, and I've got a couple beers in me, and my Yankee happened. It's not really lo- what I want to do, but Jill looks at me with those eyes, and I start walking up 4th Avenue. And I look in one of the bars on 4th Avenue, and I see about halfway out, a TV up in the upper left hand of the bar. And I looked and I said, wow, that kind of looks like the game that was today. And there I am and I said, you know, what's going on with the game? And I walk into the, I walk in and there's this hipster sitting there and he's kind of looking at the bar and he's like, oh my God, where'd you see? And I was like, I was there. He's like, you were there? And I was like, yeah, we was there with Grace and Lottie. We were there. We tabbed out. We got the whole DTM with the taste in the beer. We played all kinds of games, pull your finger. It was awesome. But in the fourth inning, like it was AC. He's like, you were there. It's unbelievable. And in the corner of the TV, you may or may not know, but there's a TV station called ESPN Classics. And that is the TV station that as soon as a sports event becomes an instant classic, it's so darn good, they play it five days in a row over and over and over. And as a sports guy, I knew something happened. And so I said, yeah, I was there. But then we left early because it was Manny Petty and we could go to Von Street Sushi and the guy could go like this and it was really awesome. And, and he's looking at me like, dude, you're like, he's looking at me saying, you're an old man and you don't, you don't even know it, do you? You don't even know what happened. I go, and I said, I, and, and so I left. And he goes, you left. And his head hit the bar. And I go, yeah, what happened? He goes, do you know, know what happened? And I go, no, I left in the fourth inning. You go to Manny Petty in the cab. You know all that stuff, you know. And he goes, they came back to win. And I go, they came back to win? And he said, yeah, they came back to win because for the first time in Major League Baseball history of 212,000 Major League Baseball games, the Yankees came back to win by hitting three grand slams. First time ever, ever. I walked out on that. (laughs) But you know who didn't? The Yankees. They hung in there to make the moment the moment that needed to be. I didn't stay in that moment. I left that moment. They stayed in that moment. I leave you with this idea of perfection imperfection over perfection, and I leave with this idea of of making the moment the moment it needs to be. And so I'll give you two of the three with time, but the idea is this. Put more life in your life. Put your more life in your life as a perfect, and what are you going to put in that parentheses? Faith, baseball, travel, gardening, biking, yourself, my family, other things to put a little bit more life in your life because it's not the functional stuff. It's the emotional stuff. It's not the tangible stuff. It's the intangible stuff. Go put more life in your life, and I promise we'll have a better place. Cheers, and enjoy the rest of the show.